All right, let me just double check that we're live and then we'll get started on this board. Yep, looks like we are live. Okay, so first off, um, the shop is a little bit different, as you may notice. So every time I move stuff around the shop, I always get questions like, hey, have you moved? Is this the same office? And to answer that off the bat, yes, this is the same office that I've been in. We just move stuff around. It's still a little bit messy. You can see I have some junk over here, and behind me is a little bit messy. Uh, but we now have a new and improved uh, workstation set up. I have my station here. I have my assistant station right over there. You can see the other microscope. We now have the ultrasonic right here instead of the other uh, in the other parts of the office. Um, and we'll be doing a updated shop tour to show the new um, expansion side of the shop that I never really showed since I moved into um, or since I took over the suite next door. So with that being said, uh, we're going to get started on this board here. This is an A1706. This is a um, so a A200239 that was sent in from a data recovery company. Now this particular board has two issues. So SSD is not detected and it doesn't turn on. So this has lifeboat port. If you plug something in the lifeboat port, the SSD is not detected and it doesn't turn on. So no, in order for us to troubleshoot SSD, we got to make it turn on first. So I am going to put this board and this camera's crooked and it's bothering me. So I'm going to fix that there. So I am going to, uh, we're going to take a look at this board and um, we're going to get it to turn on first and we're going to troubleshoot the SSD. So let's go over to my microscope and let's have a look and let's see what it does on the amp meter first as well. So on the amp meter, Jim says you're streaming at the same time as Lewis. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, well. If I get really low viewership, that's why. So I just noticed a little burn mark, not burn mark, but something in that port there. So that's something I want to take care of first because I don't want a false issue being created by a little something in the port. So I'm going to clean this up. Should still make contact. That port is fine. It's just a little bit of something in there, a little bit of corrosion in there. Could see it cleaned up fairly decently. There, done. So we're going to plug in a USB-C charge port here, and we are going to see what it does. OK, shut this off so you guys can see. We have our splash screen. We have 5 volts and 0, 0.0 amps. Now, typically on a pre-T2 um, USB-C board, that means that we have a short on PP3V3 uh, G3 hot. Now, on these boards, PP3V3 G3 hot and PP bus G3 hot will kind of, they, they, it, the voltage on DCN kind of branches off and goes to both of them. On the T2 stuff, um, it has to, the voltage has to go to PP bus first. PP bus is generated, and that then PP bus will supply the source voltage for PP um, G3 hot RTC. So I'm looking at common areas that could cause a short. I don't see anything too bad yet. Um, I see some corrosion on these coils right here, but this is, you know, this is our SSD PMIC, and um, that's minor. I mean, it doesn't look corrosion. It's just on the tip of the coil. And then I have a CD3215 here. Now we're talking because this area looks not so good. So we could see that there's some corrosion here, and we see that around our CD3215, particularly around the shield, these capacitors look really, really bad. So this could definitely be our issue. Now, what's everybody think here? Can this chip be damaged by liquid here? Can it? Theoretically, yes. Um, is it common? No, because it's underfilled, and liquid doesn't tend to get under underfill. So what I'm going to try and do 
is check for short to ground. I have 13.4 ohms on this side. And no short on this side. Can't measure it real good because the shield is in the way. So I'm going to try and this isn't burnt flux. No, this is like coffee or something. I'm going to try and cut away this shield a little bit. Um, there's really no other way to do this without cutting the shield. This is our SSD shield, so we don't want to cut it to the point where it's damaging the NAND, of course. That's pretty much common sense. Um, but what I'm going to do is I am going to take off this EMI shield right here, this EMI shield sticker. And you can see our NAND is really close. We have to be careful. And we definitely have some stuff that got under here as well. But again, the NAND is underfilled. So I don't worry too much about the NAND um, being damaged from liquid because, it, again, it's underfilled and stuff isn't really going to get under there. This looks like, yeah, this is like, this was had to have been coffee. I think this is coffee because there's like a sugar crystal there. All right, so that's done. So what I want to do, I want to cut this shield away. Now I'm going to do this really carefully with my wire cutters. And we just have to be careful. We kind of want to bend it away. So I'm just going to grab this shield and kind of bend it up. It's okay if it pulls out of the ground plane a little bit. That's not going to hurt anything. We don't want to damage the NAND. See, some people will absolutely panic if... if they rip up a little bit of the ground plane and that's okay so I have this bent up I'm being really careful not to touch the NAND now I'm going to cut just like that and now it's free and I'm going to make another final cut right here. And now we have access to our capacitor and our chip. So that's how we do this. Um, you don't want to go too close. Again, if you pull these ground pads up, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Um, you can see this comes right off, if I'm being gentle, because the, the solder is fairly brittle as it is. So it's not that hard to remove. Now, I don't recommend removing this whole shield. But you can if you want. You can see I'm pulling it on it with my wire cutters and it's coming right up. It's not pulling the pads. It's just pulling the solder up. Helps a little bit if you get it like this and you wiggle it to fatigue the solder joints a little bit. Totally unnecessary. You don't need to do this. But I don't really like leaving a like messy shield. Now see what I mean by ripping the pad? We rip the pad a little bit right there. Not a huge deal. It's just ground for the EMI shielding. So you don't have to remove the shield fully. I don't usually, to be honest, but I'm just showing you guys in case somebody does want to remove this fully. It should just come right up. Again, a little... I don't... Don't use heat here, okay? So that's another thing I need to get clear. Do not use heat. So don't use heat because you will kill the NAND, you will float it, and then you will have a problem. It just came right off. See that? We didn't use heat. We just wiggled it back and forth. We fatigued these solder joints. We didn't damage the NAND and everything as well. So that's how you do that. Let's clean this up a little bit so we can assess further what's going on here. And someone is at my door. Give me one second. Okay, we're back.
clean up this. I just want to kind of clean up this a little bit of corrosion around here. And I'm pretty sure I know why this is not turning on. I think it's this capacitor right here. And the reason why we weren't able to measure short on this is you saw I just cleaned it off and the end cap of that came right off. I mean, it just, just flew right off. So that tells me that it probably wasn't connected to the bottom of the uh, capacitor. And that's why we weren't able to measure a short. Now, this guy here. I see a lot of beginners, what they'll do, they will try and replace this capacitor. One thing I've actually seen someone do is actually run a wire to one side to the capacitor and other to the other side right here to avoid floating the chip. Don't do that because you're going to introduce more line, more noise into the line than you would have if you just left it off. This is a decoupling capacitor on PP3V3 G3 hot. It's just there to smooth the voltage out a little bit going into the CD3217. We don't have to worry about it. It's This guy's a little bit risky to put back. So we are just going to take him off and not worry about him. So I'm just going to kind of get my exacto in here and kind of wiggle it back and forth. I don't want to damage the, either the chip or the NAND. So I'm just kind of putting pressure on it. And he should come right off. Just like that. And that's all we have to do here. This guy I'm going to take off too. Pro no, this guy can probably stay. You can see he's just a little oxidized. Uh, actually, I do see a little bit of end cap damage there, so that cap can be um, compromised there, so I may take that guy off. That's one of the LDO outputs. Again, I must reiterate, this is a data recovery case. This device is probably never going to be used as a device again because the enclosure is absolutely trashed, and being an A1706, it's probably beyond economical repair. So, let's go ahead and plug this in now and see if we get any change in our symptom set by just knocking off the ugliest looking cap on the board. Twenty volts, zero point zero one, zero point zero six eight, that is booting current now. But on this port it doesn't want to work. The question is why is that? And probably because we cleaned corrosion. Now, it's common people ask or people think, well, I cleaned the corrosion and now my MacBook doesn't work. Or I just want a cleaning. Well, what happens when you clean corrosion like that is you actually remove what's making the electrical connection. So a lot of times when people come in for a cleaning, they say, oh, I just need a cleaning. I just spilled something on my MacBook. It works, you'll clean the board, and then um, it won't work. So because you get corrosion, like specifically corrosion on this little guy that's literally making the connection, you clean it off, and now it doesn't have a connection. So I want to clean this area really good and see if I can get this port to work again. I'm going to use a toothbrush and alcohol and just scrub this. This board is going in the ultrasonic afterwards anyway. Um, but I want to clean this off so I can get this port to work. So toothbrush and alcohol. Synchro says, is that alcohol or another cleaning fluid? This is 70% isopropanol alcohol. So I'm just going to scrub. Now toothbrush cleaning should not be substituted for ultrasonic cleaning by any means. It is not a suitable replacement. I'm just getting the big stuff off so I can see better. That's the only purpose of cleaning with a toothbrush is just simply so I can see better. And you can see that me doing that has served its purpose. I can see the solder joints better. Let me clean this up. Let's see what... Yeah. So I'm just going to dry this off with my hot air a little bit. All right, so I don't like this bubbling-like appearance on the top of this chip here. That could mean it got hot. It could just be something on the surface, and it's just something on the surface. Good. All right, so looking at this, I would say my issue is probably going to be related to this guy here. Everything else looks borderline okay. Little cap there. Um... See, these guys are all right. These resistors could use a little touching up. 
I don't like the looks of this capacitor or this resistor right here, the top of it. But I'm going to let it be for now. I just want to get this port to work. So I'm going to put a little flux down. Need NC559, 213. I had 213 in my hand, and 213 will not clean well in the ultrasonics. That's not what I want. Give that a second. Iron is hot, finally. Surprised this iron hasn't died yet. My hot air station and my soldering iron are pretty much the same stuff I started with. So it's honestly surprising that this stuff has lasted this long. I want to avoid using hot air if I can. And this resistor is trash. Look at that. See the end of this resistor? That resistor is not going to work. So I am going to take that one off. I, I, I really want to avoid using hot air by all means necessary here. I'm going to try and get this capacitor off too, just in case it's actively pulling down the LDO when it's on that port. So let's get this out of here. I'm going to try and do all of this with purely my iron with no hot air. I'm going to turn my iron down a little bit, a little bit too hot for my taste to be doing this. One of the other improvements that um, one of the other improvements that I've uh, I'm rolling out here is our workspaces are going to be fully HEPA filtered and the air will be recycled fully in almost in around 30 minutes. So fresh HEPA filtered air air will be recirculated every 30 minutes or so in our workstations. So that is a plus. And I'm excited to get all that fully up and going. Just medical grade air purifiers, but still I like a I like nice clean air in my my office. All right. Now this resistor is going to be the tricky one. This is where I wish I Ha, had hot tweezers because this will make it hot tweezers will make this a lot easier don't tell Jessa I said that please nobody message Jessa but I'm going to do this with my iron so that resistor you can see it just knocked off that the little filament in there probably wasn't even connected just like that I'm going to look up my resistor value, and we're going to get a new resistor on there. We're going to um, put some, put a resistor down there. So that looks like it's going to be a, let's open up flex board view here. Not a new place, Jim. Old place moved around, improved. Okay, this one was, looks like R, yeah, that's an important one, RB310, RB310 is a 100K ohm, 100K ohm 201, so 100K201, I'm going to grab my handy little resistor stash here and pull one out. Yeah, so now that we have a lot more people in here, I will show the what we did with the shop. So this is reorganized. What we did is um, a few things actually. So 
before I had my station right there and my assistant station was right here that it didn't really flow too nicely um, it was just kind of disorganized I didn't like it so what we're doing now is mirrored so on this side he has all the same stuff that I have I have my side he has his side ultrasonic on that side before ultrasonic was in one of the other rooms now that's going to be like full-on just office like administrative work and stuff um, and data recovery in that room um, so this has been moved around we've made some improvements here so we now have shelves above our station so you could see the shelf here we have our our scanners up here on each station that way we could scan when we're working on a macbook open repair shopper tab put the macbook up with the barcode scans that pulls up the ticket info saves a lot of time uh, we have shelves now down here with lighting so i'm gonna get this charger out of here because i don't need this USB-C charger here um, I have sh both shelves now have lighting so let's see so I have lighting under here which is really really nice because I like the lighting down here because when I'm in here at night when I'm not streaming I like to kind of have it kind of dark because I like to see my monitors and stuff um, so now I have my own my under shelf under cabinet light on, on the under cabinets there's two USB ports for power for charging your phone as well as another 8 amp outlet outlet for powering something else so that's super helpful um, that's pretty much it. Let me turn the lights back on. Oh, and then each station is going to have a cart like this. So I'm going to show this one second. Let me turn my lights back on. So we now we're going to have carts like this populated with all the tools we use on a daily basis. So I have my tweezers. I have syringes with isopropanol, conformal coating. Um, that's actually acetone. Conformal coating, exacto knife, screwdrivers, flux, wick, everything right here on the um, side tray. This kind of helps because it doesn't really clutter our station too much. You know, and when we have a bunch of stuff, I don't want this to fall. Um, when there's a bunch of stuff on your bench, it kind of gets cluttered, and it's really handy to have a separate cart with all your tools so your workbench stays clean. So that's that, and we are going to have an updated office tour soon as soon as I get to as soon as I get to do it as soon as I get time to do it so yeah these these under under bench lights are really nice they really add really nice um, really nice touch to the stations these have dual brightness settings too so that's that's pretty nice too so I have I have 600 lumens or 300 lumens too, so depending on which lighting I want. I'm just going to set it at 300 right now. It kind of adds a nice uh, bias there. Okay, continuing on. Here, Trey. Um... As much as I don't like Apple... I will say this. I've had a love-hate relationship with the M1. So, with the M1, I've had issues with it. I've had issues with it in coding. But one thing it can do, I'm going to go to urgent care and run out with one. Hey, that's what this actually is. It's a medical or surgical cart. <laughs> so, um, what the hell was I saying? I don't remember what I was saying. I legitimately don't remember what I was talking about. My brain just went off. Yeah, totally don't remember. Anyway, back to our board because my brain just broke. You know what? Okay, so here's what happened. My brain has not been functioning 100% after like 6 p.m. today. You know when you take a nap and you wake up and you're like kind of confused? Because you wake up like in the middle of your... Oh, yeah, that's right, M1. Okay, so one thing that the M1 can do better than... Or the Mac Mini with the M1 that that has really came out above the top compared to other machines is recording and streaming. So before on like Ryzen, um, Ryzen or Intel-based machines, that would have random issues with audio clipping, just random performance issues when... Um, recording I would have frame drops and recording with the M1 there's none of that like I'm this is the base model Mac mini with 8 gigabytes of RAM and it streams just fine I mean it streams perfectly when I even when I multitask if I'm multitasking with a VM open it'll get slow but for the most part it's um, 
it's very decent at recording and having the videos be recorded properly. I don't encode on it. I save that to my SSD and take that uh, to my ThinkPad to encode, but it does do a very good job at recording and having the recording file come out good. And it's not bad. I mean, I I can't complain about a $600 desktop that does as much as this little thing does. As much as I hate Apple. No, you get back down here. There, that's perfect. Now I can go on my other side and get this resistor back. There is a slight chance the CD is fried or that we might have caused a little crack in it when we took off that cap. It's rare, it would be rare. But if I have to replace it, I have to replace it. Bryce, is that the Intel model? The, if that's the Intel model MacBook Air, those suck. Those are terrible. I bought an M1 MacBook Air because, um, well, before the, my first course, I bought an M1 MacBook Air because I broke my ThinkPad op trying to change the trackpad, believe it or not. So what I did is I opened my ThinkPad to change my trackpad. I put the trackpad in, and as I'm reassembling it, to go to put the bottom cover on, my hand went up, it snagged the heat sink, and it bent the heat, the heat pipe up like, like that, and it's a really thin heat sink. And I couldn't get a heat sink until after my course. I needed the MacBook, cause I'm, I mean the ThinkPad, because I was traveling. So um, I bought a MacBook Air because I thought, okay, if I buy this MacBook Air, I could learn how it works, have more reason, more stuff to teach to the class, and I get a, you know, I have something to use. So I did that, and then I sold it after. And it was our, it was a, that I couldn't complain about that machine either. It was a, I mean. It was a thousand dollar laptop. It worked well well for what it was. The battery life was decent. Would I want to travel with that again? No. Because I know if it in my usage scenario, I mean that thing would be toast in no time. Alright, I can't tell if I actually soldered that or not. So I'm gonna switch to a different tip here that I could get in here. Yeah, Malls, I totally agree. The pros are... I mean, there's almost really no incentive to buy the Pro over the Air. Or the M1 Air. And I'm going to be doing a video on the new machine as well. Because there's going to be a design flaw that... <laughs> We're not going to like, and I want to talk about that, so I've already noticed it. So if, if you think that, that the new machines are going to be more reliable, the, A2, the A20 2100 or the 14-inch version, nope, you're wrong. We're going to see the same nonsense failures that we see in 1990s and 1700s, and it's a, it's a component placement issue that I thought they would have learned, but they didn't learn. Anyway, um, oh, wait a second, what am I doing? This is the wrong side. I'm trying, trying to troubleshoot this port, and it's this side that's not working, which is, yeah, interesting. Okay, so I'm being dumb. I'm, I'm a smooth brain. I was, this is the side that's not working. I was working over here. So let's see if both of the ports, or the port that I worked on actually works. Okay. Yeah, look at that. Hmm. We have a lot of issues here. So, <laughs> yeah. Look at all of that. Oh, wow, they're knocked off, too. Interesting. Let's clean this up. I am not replacing every one of those little caps there. Again, it's a data recovery case. We're not going to waste our time with that. We're going to clean this up just to prevent any crosstalk. We're going to pull the data off this board. 
we really only needed to get to turn on and see the SSD so I could lifeboat it. Let's clean all this stuff off so I don't get crosstalk causing issues. And it doesn't look overly bad now. We do have some knocked off capacitors that were really bad. I want to do a dedicated video on um, leaving capacitors off because I see some people give me crap about it. And the people that give me crap about it probably don't understand what a capacitor is or what a capacitor does. So that looks better. Um, the internal pins look all right. Let's give it a shot. The board will work fine without these capacitors here. Th these are just mainly sp uh, protection, stuff for protection, ESD protection, things like that. Which again, we're going to care about ESD if we're long-term use, but not if we are short-term use. 70, 64, whatever works. Does this side work? Because I'm most concerned about the ports that I worked on. Oh, you know what's bad? It's my damn... This. This is the issue. Let's grab a different test port. So the thing is with with test ports here, our test ports are a little bit special. When ports, when USB-C ports end up on our bench as test ports, they usually have a history behind them. They're usually not well. They usually come here to feel better. And in turn, they usually have something wrong with them. And that's why they are, they've been taken out of a customer's machine and placed onto our bench for testing purposes. And as you can see, I grabbed another one and it is working just fine on the port that we touched. So anyway, and now if we were to go on this side and test this port, it's going to work fine as well. So Yep, as you can see, this port is now working. So, there we go, 0.68. I have some heat sink warmth. That is good. I have some dirt on my bench. we got to clean that up. And then we are going to figure out what's going on with our SSD. I want to make sure it boots. And then we're going to see what's going on with our SSD. Um, I'm actually debating on not even, depending on how the enclosure works, I may not even go further with that. I mainly just want it to be seen in lifeboat, but we'll see how it does. We'll see how bad the enclosure is. If I remember from my notes, it's pretty bad. Let's clean up my workstation. And let me grab, let's see, what slot is this in? A1706. Okay, this isn't so bad. Uh, it's pretty bad. Never mind. I would retract that. It's going to work good enough for us to test this. So, my guess is it's going to turn on, but it's not going to have an SSD. Because, like I said, Lifeboat was already tried. If Lifeboat didn't work, then if Lifeboat worked, it wouldn't be here. So, yeah, so I am not going to plug in a lot of stuff here. Well, I'm not going to plug in my headphone jack or my touch ID because this stuff is all corroded to hell. I'm not going to plug in my touch bar. Everything else is good. Trackpad connector is not burned. Okay. Actually, touch bar. I could probably clean this. Uh, yeah, we'll clean this up a little bit. I need a haircut. I'm going to go get a haircut tomorrow. One thing I know, so I have not had this problem since I've had facial hair, is I will get customers that will come into my store, and they'll be like, oh, are you doing the repair? Man, I'm like, no, I'm not doing the repair. Absolutely not. I'm just a front desk person. I haven't had that problem since I've had facial hair, because when I, when I don't have facial hair, and especially if my hair is like it is now, I look like a 10-year-old or 14-year-old. When I have facial hair and shorter hair, and I ask people, like, how old do you think I am? They're like, uh, 30? So that's good. You can't probably can't see it on camera, but I actually do have gray hair. So that, that assists in the whole, um, 
looking more experienced deal. I think anybody that's in this industry for any amount of time, longer than six months, ends up getting gray hair. It's normal. Okay. So I kind of have a suspicion of what's wrong with our SSD. Now, I don't really want to go into all the SSD power rails, but these A1706s are affected by a really common problem, especially after liquid damage with the SSD detection. So let's plug this in and see what we get. No, that's not good, says Bryce. What's not good? Gray hair? Okay. I have trackpad click, 0 0.72, 0 0.49. We should be posting here. Can't tell if we have backlight yet. All right, I have keyboard backlight. These 1706s are really hard to see the backlight on, so I'm going to wait for it to flash question mark. At a bare minimum, I know it's posting now, so that's a good sign our CPU is alive. Maybe we don't have backlight. Our backlight circuit's clean, though. Our screen might be bad really hard to see. Let's shut off my light here. Let me clean the screen off too. Yeah, gray hair happens. I think I had gray hair. I started getting gray. <laughs> I think when I was 19, when I when I first opened my stores, when I when I started getting gray hair. And so we are not getting any LCD signal, and that is probably because our screen is bad because it's corroded. So now we're clean. Yeah, I don't have any bald spots yet. I hope I don't go bald. Can't see backlight either. Let's try let's try resetting the connector here. Everything looks fine here. But again, I have caps lock, so I might just have to show you guys with lifeboat that it's not being detected, and then when it does get detected, because again, I only care about data in this instance. One other trick that you can see if a board at one of these 1706s or 1708s or 1707s are posting is you can grab your meter, voltage mode of course, and measure CPU vCore on the coils near the CPU. And if it's posting, we will get 0.7 volts contrary to 0.9 volts. So if you have 0.9 volts, the board is not posting. If you have 0.7 or 0.6, the board is actually posting and, and starting to boot. So I have no image or no backlight. It might be backlight. It's hard to say. What's my output voltage? 43 volts. Okay, there we go. Now it works. After I reseated the connector, it worked. Okay. So look at this. Flashing question mark. Wow, you can't see that. The camera legit doesn't pick that up. There you go. You can kind of see it there. See that? That's bizarre. You can see the flashing folder there. Any plans for another training session? Yes, absolutely, in May. So you can sign up now for the iPad Rehab MacBook Repair course. I will be there in May um, on training.ipadrehab. Now, word of caution. This may end up being our last course. We don't know yet. It all depends on... Um, it all depends on how it goes, and it's not that the course is bad, it's that we have to see if, if it's going to fill. Because last time we didn't really fill, um, but this may be your last chance, and if it's not your last chance, we're probably only going to be doing this once or twice a year. But if you want to sign up and go to the MacBook course, make sure to click, or make sure to check this out here. Go down here. It is in May, May 16th through 22nd. And you could sign up in this link.
So, and the course is actually discounted a little bit too. I think we're doing it for 2,500 now. Let me see. Uh, yeah, 2,500, and we now have optional if you want to stay on the weekend and work on some stuff. I'll be there, um, full on seven, actually longer than seven. Yeah, seven days. So, Monday through Sunday, I will be there instructing. If you're interested in going, so this doesn't have SSDs. So. We're going to let chat. Where's Caleb at? Well, probably Caleb is at home because it's 9.15 p.m. on a Saturday night. And I should probably be home, too, or doing something else because it's 9.15 on a Saturday night and I'm 20 years old. So, But I'm here fixing MacBooks because I have to fix MacBooks. So A1706, let's talk about SSD detection issues. A vast majority of SSD detection issues without the presence of liquid damage on A1706s will be failed controllers. The controller is the chip that is like the CPU for the SSD, and that guy is over here. I'll show you. So a vast majority of A1706, no SSD cases, are going to be failed controllers or failed NANs themselves. And A1706's failed NANs are a little bit more rare, but it's usually the controller. And controller is under here. Now this looks like garbage. I know here this looks like garbage, so that's... The board turns on. We're going to take care of that in a minute. But let me pop up the shield. Can you just go bother me? Can you just go bother me in the AV? Sure, you can bother me in the AV. I mean... Oh, Caleb is here. I was going to say buy beers and party on stream, but they won't let you. Caleb can. Caleb's Caleb drinks. Caleb keeps showing up to work drunk, and it's really annoying. So this is an and. The con where's the controller? This is the controller, I think. Come on. I don't want to bend my tweezers. Let me go grab a piece of... Uh, let me just take one of Caleb's tweezers. So let's get this off of here. Ah, come on. This is just glued with coffee or whatever this substance is. What is this? Come on. There we go. Come on. Ah. This is the controller here. This is like a this is actually an Apple made chip, you can kind of see in the lettering, but this is like an ARM little an ARM CPU that um um, controls SSD functions. It basically provides a bridge between the SSD and the PCH. It talks to our Piccolo PMIC right here, which will the controller will say, hey, give my SSD power. Um, if the Piccolo chip is not outputting voltage, it's usually because um, it is not being told to by the controller. So a vast majority of A1706 cases with liquid damage or without liquid damage will have dead controllers. So I, I would use my nail, but I just trimmed my nails, and there I have no more nails. So, this guy is really common to fail. Is it pract practical to replace? No, because I believe if you replace this, the NANs won't work anymore because they're kind of serialized, not quite. But what is common on A1706s with liquid damage is the 2v7 NAND VIN line. And if we look here, we can see that it's been already scraped away. What do we see here? We see a probe point that is totally gone. This is common. So this is very, very common on 8706s that present without uh, with liquid damage with no SSD function. You will see that this resistor will be corroded and falling apart and this, this probe point here will be corroded. So I'm going to clean this up really well. Just like that. All right, look at that. That's our issue right there. So that is, I'll show you, let me show you. Actually, I can't show you on the schematic because I only have one screen right now. Can I show you on the schematic? Yeah, let's open a window capture.
Okay. Window capture. Window capture. I don't want to show something I'm not supposed to. Not that there's anything bad on my screen, but I don't want to show any customer info and in repair shopper and stuff like that. You kind of find that customers don't appreciate when that happens. Okay. Window capture. Here we go. So, this is our resistor right here. This is our resistor here. We see we have one side that says PPVIN 2V7 and underscore LB. I don't know what LV, LV stands for, but I see I have this probe point. Goes in that little trace, there's a via, and then there's these capacitors here. Now, I'm trying to figure out where this takes power from, so I'm still I'm going to try and figure this out. And I look, it's like, hmm, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be going from anywhere. It just says VIN, so it's a voltage input, but I need to figure out where this comes from. So let's try and find a resistor, because usually... When we have something that looks like this, there's a resistor somewhere. And let's try and find this. Where did where do you come from? Do I need to open the schematic? Probably. Cuz it doesn't just come out of thin air. Is the corroded pro point similar to a shorted cap then? No. A so a shorted cap would be short. So we have three, we have, uh, a line could fail in three ways. Okay, so uh, come on. A line could fail in three ways. Short circuit, open circuit, or the guy upstairs not doing its job. So a guy upstairs not doing its job would be like, let's say we're missing 2v7 NAND because the Piccolo PMIC is bad. Okay, open line would be like a broken probe point where the line is open, it's broken, electrons cannot flow through, or a short circuit would be, um, Something like a capacitor that's shorted to ground and pulling that voltage right to ground. So no, a, a pro point would be something totally different. All right, let's go back. So I could tell you. So I'm. Uh, I could tell you from experience where this is coming from, but that spoils it. So let's try and find this. Seven. And is it VCC? What's this say? BCC. It's not this one either. Whatever, let's go on a schematic. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to go through all this. It's on a page here somewhere. I'll just tell you what it is. This is derived from PP bus. Okay, this is derived from PP bus. It's a VIN. It's called PP VIN NAND whatever because it branches off from a current sensing resistor for current sensing purposes, obviously. And once it goes to that resistor, it's called PP 2V7 NAND VIN. What its purpose is is to power the uh, buck regulator for the uh, NAND, which is right here. This is one of the many NAND rails, and it's derived from PP bus. Okay, you can see it follows over here. Um, there is a current sensing resistor here somewhere, somewhere here. I don't know where, but it's somewhere here, and it comes from PP bus. But if, okay, our, our VIN is going to go through here. It's going to go through here, through this resistor, then going on the other side of the board. This, I believe, is a voltage divider right here. Let me just double check here that this is indeed a voltage divider. divider not this wrong window flex BV PDF and it's not open did it close did it crash did I close it I did close it that sucks Caleb said he's passing away F in chat for Caleb and that also means we have an open employment spot. Yeah, that was a voltage divider. And you can see it goes to U9300, which is the PSSD PMIC. So let's go over to my window capture again. All right. 
So we have a voltage divider here. We have a 1.3 milliohm mega ohm resistor, and that's going to shed some voltage to ground. All right, so it's going to take our PP bus voltage. It's going to be pulled down from that resistor that I was talking about, right? Some of that's going to go to ground, and it's going to go onto this other line called Piccolo IUVD. Now, this is a special number here, 1.3 and 215. Okay, so it's going to it's going to cut that voltage into a lower number, um, and obviously, if that resistor is bad it's not going to happen so if this resistor if the line is open that's not going to happen so question is here is this resistor actually bad probably not this resistor probably measures just fine um, i could actually measure this resistor and show you that it probably measures just fine and i probably don't have to replace it um, but i do have a problem with that one line right there so here's my meter i am going to measure it here you can see it right here Ohms mode, not not continuity mode. Nope, this is definitely oh, this just fell off the board as soon as I touched it. All right, that one is bad, so that is not going to work. So yeah, we definitely replace it if it looks like that. So my criteria for replacing resistors is when the bottom pad looks like this. So I couldn't tell if it looked like this or not, but I touched the resistor and it literally fell off. So this guy's no good. He's blown. He's no good. We're gonna discard him. This one, this pad is totally trashed. So I'm going to scrape away some of that copper. I want to expose this trace too because one other thing I've seen is this trace will corrode internally and you'll think you're good here, but it'll actually still be broken. So I want to expose this trace the best that I can. Yeah, see this? What would happen if we ran a wire here? There's nothing there. The trace is gone. It's physically gone. There's, it's all corroded. So look at that. Totally gone. I'm glad I, I, that was shown so I it proved my point. So we have a nice spot to run a wire from. Good. Clean this up again. Let's get a little solder on here. I'm at, this is actually Amtec 4300 solder. It's okay. It's probably better than Kester. It's not better than this other stuff I had that I can't get anymore because it hasn't been made since the 90s. I would need to jump this to create the connection. That is absolutely true. This tip is really small and it's not really transferring heat effectively, but I just want to make sure I have a good amount of solder on here and then I'm going to come in with my big tip now. And we're going to get a 1.3 milliohm resistor and replace it there. Um, and, uh, you know, I've heard from a friend of a friend of a friend that if you use a 1 milliohm resistor, that the board will work just fine as well. So just, just putting that out there. So if you, have a w if you can't find a 1.3 milliohm resistor, but you have a 1, not milliohm, megaohm resistor, a 1 megaohm, a 1 megaohm resistor will work just fine. 
But, I mean, it was from a friend of 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 a friend that told me. So don't take it from a grain of salt. But I'm going to grab a quote-unquote 1.3 mega ohm resistor and replace it. Get the resistor here. That's that. I'm going to grab a wire now. Um, what kind of mood am I in? Do I want 37 gauge? Do I want smaller than 37 gauge? 37 gauge. Some flux in here, that wire's tacked down. No, run away. That needs more solder. I don't like that at all. I'm just going to get this side down on the resistor. Come on. There we go. Now I can get more on this side. Nice solid joint there. And now the real moment of truth is to see if this works. And let's see if we saved somebody's data tonight. Data is much more important than a MacBook. Saving somebody's data means a lot more to me than saving somebody's MacBook. Because a MacBook is just a MacBook. Data is different. But let's see. Let's see if we get anything. So let's put our board back in here. Don't need speakers, trackpad, keyboard, screen. We know I don't really care too much about touch bar either, but I'll plug it in. USB port. Okay, so let's Power this on. It's plugged in, and now we wait. My meter fell over. My meter just wants to pass away. It just fell, fell right over. That's sad. All right, MacBook, what are you doing? You should be giving me something. You're scaring me. You're boot looping. Are you boot looping? 0 0.58. Are you boot looping or are you just being weird? 0 0.58, 0 0.50. That is a Apple logo and the screen is severely damaged. <laughs> yeah, look at that screen. Look at that beautiful water damaged, dark, stained LED strip out screen. It works though and the data is saved. This is booted. So. Um, yeah, the screen is destroyed. <laughs> That's why it's so dark. I mean, the the um, the one of the LED strips looks like it's out, and it's all just liquid spilled. But this is booted to an operating system. This is another MacBook with data saved, and I think that's it for tonight. Um, so with that being said, 
I think we're going to call it quits tonight. I think I'm going to go home now. And that is it. So thank you for watching, and I hope this video helps you. Remember, A1706 presenting no SSD detection without liquid damage, probably a bad controller, no fix. A1706 with liquid damage, probably that resistor and that trace that I just showed you. So um, that's it for today, and I will see you in the next stream or video. I need to edit a video, and while actually... Um, let me take my SSD because I keep forgetting this, um, forgetting to take this with me so I can edit videos. My videos are on here, so I'm going to take this with me and get some editing done. Um, but thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.